like, oh, I did not want that to happen. So, yeah, yeah I know if all the webinars are set to record as soon as we hit broadcast. Oh, now let's see. What do I need to do to make sure that we're going to get my computer sound? Under more, there is a button to push. So if you click more, one of those. Okay, options. share computer sound. And we also want to optimize share for full screen video clip. Okay, excellent. So I guess that will take care of it. And so what will people see? Will they just see my screen or will they also see uh, Dave? They'll, they'll also see Dave. Okay. So as long as his camera's up. Yeah, I will, uh, I'll try to remember to turn off my camera uh, once I'm done with the introduction. And then uh, Josh, you have those questions that Dave sent as uh, uh, canned questions to get the Q&A started? I will. Uh, I, I know where the email is. I have to pull it up. So, uh, right. but yes, as I'm making the quick change in the uniform. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have mine on. Well, it's all right. Thank you. You're the speaker, it's okay. Good. Ah. Don't hurt oh. yourself. It just, oh, what a long day. <laughs> what a long, long, long day. <sighs> Can you it's, find the questions, Josh? Uh, I will want to, I, I have time. Okay. That's later on. So, sure. Trace this at a time. It's dated, they see, July 25th at 11.25 a.m. Cool. Josh will be interested to know that uh, in the last 24 hours, I've been made aware of three new auxiliary chartered Sea Scout ships. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so uh, this time last month, we had six. At the moment we have 10 in and another three that are sitting in council offices uh, getting processed. Although one of them, the uh, council registrar called up national and was told that the auxiliary was not allowed to sponsor ships. So we've asked the, the person to have the council register fi registrar find out who's giving out that bad information. All right, um, so we're now two and a half minutes before the hour. I'm assuming in in another 30 seconds or so, we're going to want to start letting people in. Yeah, and that way we'll start to share us to Facebook and YouTube. So the first couple minutes are just us getting that taken care of. So, right, so we should probably very, stop uh, chatting among ourselves. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give everyone a warning that we're going to go live. Okay. And Is there a, a time uh, that we're going to try to stick to strictly? Uh, or well, we definitely don't want to go over an hour. Uh, and if we can make it more like 55 minutes or, or even 50 minutes, that would be okay. When do you start the clock? When I first start talking or when you all start talking? When, when I start talking. Yeah. Cutting into my time already, yeah? It won't take long. <laughs> cool. All right. I'm going to start and we'll, but just let people in. Okay.
Good evening, everyone. We're uh, just a little bit ahead of the top of the hour, and we'll probably start about uh, one or two minutes late to give the late arrivers uh, an opportunity to get settled in. Uh, I see we've got a steady flow of people coming in now. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We are also live on Facebook. So okay. this is Josh Gilliland. I'm the chair of our uh, marketing committee. And it's a pleasure to have you all here tonight for our Coast Guard Tech Talks video. And I'm going to turn the show over to Bruce Johnson as it's now just 1800 on the West Coast. And we'll get started momentarily. Bruce? Sure. Let's get going. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third Coast Guard Tech Talks workshop. These workshops are jointly sponsored by the U.S. Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America's Sea Scout Program. My name is Bruce Johnson, and I serve as the chief of the Coast Guard Auxiliary's youth programs. Our co-host is Josh Gilliland, chair of the National Sea Scout Communications and Marketing Team. Josh will be coordinating your questions in the third part of the program. Coast Guard Tech Talks are held monthly on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 2100 Eastern, 2000 Central, 1900 Mountain, and 1800 Pacific Time. Each program focuses on a single science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM topic. These topics are chosen to support the Sea Scout Advancement Program Next month's Tech Talks workshop will be on uh, paddlecraft uh, construction. Excuse me. Tonight's topic is marine environmental protection. Our presenter is Dr. Dave Gruber, science, uh, I'm sorry, Marine Safety District Staff Officer for the Coast Guard Auxiliary's 5th Southern District. Dave holds Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and Doctor of Philosophy degrees. He's the president and TNI lab director of Biological Monitoring Incorporated in Blacksburg, Virginia. He's also a 17-year veteran of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, where he serves as a marine safety specialist and boat crew coxswain. One last thing, we've muted your microphones to make it easier for everybody to hear. If you have questions, please tap, uh, type them in the chat box. Josh will be monitoring the chat and will be sure to leave time to answer your questions at the end. So without any further ado, let's welcome uh, Dave and we're looking forward to hearing you. Take it away, Dave. Thank you, Bruce, Josh. Yeah. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to the opportunity to give you a little snapshot of uh, what my career and life has been involved with. And I guess if we'll start off with the first slide or two, you won't just have to listen and look at me. I've been asked to talk about two subjects. Oops, there they go. The uh, Federal Water Pollution Control Act and the Aquatic Nuisance Species. We'll jump off of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, of, also known as the Clean Water Act nowadays, and we'll talk a little bit specifically about oil pollution. At the end, we'll have some kind of homework that'll be posted out there somewhere for you all, and a little project that I think you'll find uh, quite easy to build and construct and uh, that would provide a good service to your local environment. So let's start off with that first slide there, Bruce or Josh, whoever's doing that. Our ocean. Nearly 4 billion years old. Self-regulating self-healing, the source of all life on Earth. Yet it is in danger, threatened
threatened by a truly global problem, marine pollution. From the remotest Pacific Islands to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, to right here on the beaches of Malta. Oil spills, ship emissions, industrial waste and pesticides, all poison vast stretches of water. 10 million tons of litter are dumped in the sea every year, 400 kilos per second. By 2050, our ocean could contain more plastic than fish. Pollution is destroying marine life. Plastics alone are killing 1 million seabirds and 100,000 marine mammals a year. Microplastics threaten to unhinge whole ecosystems. These problems don't stop at sea. Contaminants such as mercury accumulate in the food chain, affecting the health of millions of people. With 80% of marine litter coming from land sources, everyone is responsible. But the solution is at hand, and it offers a great opportunity. Marine pollution costs billions. Switching to circular economies could make up for this loss and more, with environmental, economic, and social gains for all. So to reverse the trend of ever-increasing marine pollution, how can we minimize waste? How can we prevent plastics from reaching the sea? How can we stop marine pollution? So how can we stop marine pollution? I think that's uh, going to be up to you, your generation, to do something about it. I think uh, perhaps we've left this uh, entire earth uh, in a bit of a shambles. But uh, I'll give you an idea of some of the things that have occurred, at least in my uh, adult life, uh, starting back in the 70s. But uh, in talking about the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, it actually has its roots going back to 1948. And although it made it unlawful for anybody to discharge pollutants uh, from a point source into navigable waters, and, and remember those two terms, we're gonna talk a, a hair about those, and that's some of your homework, point source and navigable waters. But although it was unlawful for that to occur, the, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, the original one of 1948, had no teeth it really didn't have any regulatory enforcement power. But come 1970, uh, the United States started to consolidate many of the environmental responsibilities. And what came of that was the Environmental Protection Agency. And that was a new agency. Uh, and although that might have been before many of you were born, it certainly uh, uh, was not. Uh, I was already I don't know, 30 years old practically when that came in to be. But, uh, uh, and you'll see that this law has continued on. It's gotten amended over the years. It's become known as the Clean Water Act. And uh, uh, there's been an awful lot of uh, public awareness and concern for controlling water pollution. So before I move on, I mentioned that point source and navigable water. Uh, point source versus non-point source, if you think of a pipe discharging uh, waters, uh, you might think they're all point sources, but that's only considered a point source if it is uh, uh, actually has a, a treated discharge or an untreated discharge, but not considered a point source, even though it comes out the pipe, if it contains our our, uh, our runoff from our lands. And you probably walk outside your own homes and you'll notice uh, lots of storm sewers. Maybe they even have little placards on them that say that this, this uh, storm sewer discharges into the local body of water. And so don't pollute, don't throw things down here. But the other thing is, is that ever since its beginning, EPA has been uh, charged with with um, 
regulating point sources and they're discharging into so-called navigable waters. But what has changed, and it's a political game, is the definition of navigable waters. Perhaps most recently, uh, the latest definitions of navigable waters with the latest regulations kind of loosens up a little bit and perhaps isn't as, as strict as it perhaps should be. Can we get the next slide? Pesticides had become a way of life in post-war America, and by 1955, the country was being treated with more than 600 million pounds a year. But in 1962, the chemical industry, the government, and agribusiness were accused of poisoning the environment in a book called Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? They should not be called insecticides, but biocides. Rachel Carson painted a nightmare vision of the future. Silent Spring polarized the nation, and the ensuing controversy changed the course of history. A great book has a flow to it and it changes uh, people's minds, it changes their outlook and it has a long reach. Uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring is still uh, affecting our thinking and our policy making today. The essence of Rachel's message was that we had to come to terms with nature and work with it and not against it. In a complex modern society, of course, that's, that was a very radical concept. But in the sense of a, a change in our thought, I think she was revolutionary. I don't want you all to think that I'm ancient, although I'm not young. But when they talked about post-war America uh, and some of that occurring back in 1955, I was eight years old. So uh, the, all this occurred in my lifetime. And this one here that you're about to look at, when uh, this is perhaps, as it says, the sparks that ignited the whole environmental movement. Go ahead. Well, Northeast Ohio has come a long way since a 1969 riverfront fire on the Cuyahoga River. Question, how did the river spark a national question? Question, how is the river positioned right now for Cleveland's future? The day began routinely, high temperatures 73 degrees, Sunday, June 22nd, 1969. Dissecting Cleveland, the Cuyahoga River was making its inevitable push toward Lake Erie, slow moving water, but that day much more was in the river flow, which would thrust Cleveland into a horrible spotlight. Heavy pollution had spewed from the industrial valley into the river's flow. Overhead was a train crossing a trussle spanning the river. The industry spewed oil slick was larger than a football field. The sparks dropping from the locomotive ignited the slick and created my body down. Is that okay? Cleveland firefighters were called. When they arrived, it was then accelerating up onto the trestle and caught the trestle of fire. At the Western Reserve Fire Museum, Paul Nelson shows the fire battalion's chief log of the incident. A witness to the fire was former WKYC Channel 3 news reporter Joe Mossbrook, who covered the fire. Mossbrook knew of many fires over the years, but on this day... There was some damage to the trestle. It wasn't destroyed by any means. It was just a small fire. But the small fire led to a big event. 50 years later, the Cleveland firefighter boat used that 1969 day is operational. Joe remembers the next day when Mayor Carl Stokes complained about 
a polluted Cuyahoga River. The mayor wanted to know what the state was doing about regulating the plants that were spewing their bad stuff into the river. Several weeks later, a national news magazine published the story, but used photographs from earlier, bigger blazes. Cleveland was called a disaster, but something good eventually came because the burn on the river ignited a revolution. Because of the Time Magazine uh, article that was out, uh, but they, I think the nation really saw us as the, the guide stone for, uh, for how we really needed to look at the environmental cleanup of the entire nation. This gave birth to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Water Act of 1972, and a national consciousness on protecting the environment. The Cuyahoga has long been a working river. Heavy manufacturing exists on this waterway. So too does recreational uses. But question, can the two, heavy manufacturing and recreation, coexist on the same waterway? In other words, can both flow in the same direction? Yes, heavy riverbank manufacturing is still here, but cleaner. Heavy fisted freighters still muscle up and down the Cuyahoga, but the water is clean enough for recreational use. But they, they just have to understand that they are on a working river, yeah. and the, uh, the freighters have to understand that there are boaters around them. The Ohio EPA has judged the Cuyahoga River clean enough for consumption of its fish. 50 years after the river burn, Cleveland commemorates the fire. No celebration of the fire, but remembrance of the spark it gave to a national environmental movement which grew out of the day Cleveland's Cuyahoga River caught fire. Leon Bibb, Channel 3 News. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Betsy, we've come a long, long way in the half century since that river right over there mm -hmm. caught fire. A long, long way. And it's not perfect, but we have made so many strides. And, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people don't realize that it was the Cuyahoga River fire that yeah. spurred the initiation, the creation of the EPA, yeah. which is now saving rivers all over the country. If there is a ground zero, if we can use that term, it is Cleveland. Yep. But we've progressed. All right, so uh, in 1972, this uh, Federal Water Pollution Control Act through amendments kind of evolved into the Clean Water Act. And it established now a permitting system, system for point source discharges. So it gave EPA a lot of authority. They were given the authority to implement pollution control programs uh, to, to hold the dischargers hold their toe to the ground and implement fines, big fines. They established water quality standards or criteria, which uh, criteria would be the chemical specific parameters that are allowed to be in the water body segment in order to protect its designated use. These are some terms that you'll, you'll come across when you do your homework. Some of the designated uses you might find are recreational water, contact, contact recreational water, um, drinking water, trout waters, uh, put and take trout waters, a whole slew, depending on the individual state of different water quality standards, their designated uses, and the criteria of the in-stream values that protect those designated uses. So this was a pretty heavy and significant um, law that came into effect back in 1972 and has continued to evolve. Now, one thing as we kind of jump into the next segment is that it also prohibited the discharge of oil or hazardous substances into the waters of the U.S. And if we go on to the next slide. Oil pollution in the oceans can have a disastrous effect on marine life. It often takes a major incident at sea like a tanker spill or oil rig explosion for most people to grasp the extent of the problem. Oil slicks can drift towards coastlines, killing seabirds and marine mammals, but these types of spills account for just 10% of global marine oil pollution. 
Most is produced by everyday maritime traffic including illegal dumping and tank cleaning or onshore industrial activities. The ecological impact differs according to the location. Deep sea spills tend to be relatively limited and they clear up easier. As the oil becomes denser, it sinks, is broken down and destroyed by bacteria. Oil slicks on a rocky coastline or exposed beach can have a significant impact on marine ecosystems and take up to a year to be cleared away by wave action. Coral reefs are highly sensitive to oil pollution. Damage is often irreversible and coral regeneration can take up to 10 years. And pollution in mangroves or on sandbanks can cause very serious damage, lasting more than 20 years. So one of the things that came out of the All Pollution Act, which in the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, is that all vessels, all boats 26 feet or longer are required to post this particular placard or one similar to this at least. That's letting them know that the discharge of oil is prohibited. So uh, you can't just dump your oil over your oily wastes. You can't dump them over. But, you know, a lot of times oil, if you're out there on the water, gets down in your bilge, you know, the lowest part of your boat. And bilge pumps come on automatically or even manually. And now you've got a discharge of an oily substance with the bilge water. And that's illegal. And you can be fined significantly for doing that. You notice on this placard uh, down at the bottom there, the National Response Center, anytime you see a pollution event, Learn that number, 800-424-8802. It's manned by the Coast Guard, and they will then in turn uh, start the ball rolling and get the appropriate local agency to deal with the, the uh, pollu pollution findings that you've seen. So don't be afraid to use that National Response Center. Okay, next slide. Now we're going to kind of slide into what aquatic nuisance species are. They're invasives. They're non-indigenous species. They're organisms that weren't there originally. They weren't there. You know, sometimes you have to ask yourself with a, with a grain of salt, is this good or is this bad? And when, how long ago? Uh, what do you want the earth to get back to? Do we want it to get back to what it was like back in Pocahontas' time? A lot of philosophical questions. But uh, in any case, these non-indigenous species certainly threaten the diversity and abundance of our native species. So uh, they're important and we have uh, a number of acts that uh, protect our environment from these aquatic nuisance species. And the next couple of slides are gonna talk about a couple of them. Aquatic nuisance species are species that threaten the survival of native aquatic species. They are not native to that environment. Two such aquatic nuisance species are the zebra mussel and the quagga mussel. States spend millions of dollars each year trying to control these prolific species. Non-native aquatic nuisance plants such as purple loose reef, Eurasian water milfoil, and hydrilla quickly take over replacing native plants. The dense growth of these weeds impacts the environment and the economy in a negative way. Be conscientious when you're pulling your boat from recreational water. Inspect the boat, the trailer, while in the ramp area. Remove any suspected aquatic nuisance species and mud so that they don't spread to other waters that you may visit. Now I'm gonna play devil's advocate here for a minute. Before we get into this next slide, in that uh, you saw these like zebra mussels, they get into pipes and they just totally clog up our water intakes, drinking water intakes, and they really do cause havoc. They're filter feeders, just like all bivalves. Well, the interesting thing is that they've cleaned up our Great Lakes, and some of them, like Lake Erie, uh, from all these sediments that now it's become a great smallmouth bass fishery because other fish have been able to come in and invade like the uh, 
uh, these little gobies that the small mouth love to eat. So this is a case of aquatic nuisance species, but if you were to ask the small mouth bass fishermen, they'd say, well, this is a real good thing. And then the same thing with these aquatic weeds, like the hydrilla, they're a real nuisance if you're gonna try to run your boat through them, if you wanna swim in the lake, if you've had a real proliferation of these uh, aquatic of this aquatic vegetation. On the other hand, the fishermen, particularly the largemouth bass fishermen, have a saying that hydrilla breeds Godzilla. So it definitely provides a lot of habitat for fish, and they grow pretty big as compared to when they don't have this aquatic these aquatic weeds. So in our local lake up here in southwest Virginia, where I am. Clater Lake, uh, the residents, with the help of the Game and Inland Fisheries, the state agency, they decided to get rid of all the aquatic plants that they could, and they introduced a, a triploid uh, carp, the Asian carp that would eat all this algae, and it did. It wiped out all of it. And now, from a recreational standpoint, the, the uh, bass clubs uh, uh, really resented that. So it's a balance. We have to all share the orders. Okay, we can move on on this one. The spread of invasive aquatic species in ships' ballast water has long been recognized as a major environmental threat, and this convention addresses it at the global level. So what does it mean for ships? From the day this convention enters into force, all ships engaged in international traffic must manage their ballast water so as to avoid the introduction of alien species into coastal waters. For most ships, that means either exchanging their ballast water or treating it using an approved ballast water management system. Initially, there'll be two different standards corresponding to these two options. The D1 standard requires ships to exchange their ballast water in open seas, away from coastal waters. Ideally, this means at least 200 nautical miles from land and in water at least 200 metres deep. By doing this, fewer organisms will survive, and so ships will be less likely to introduce potentially harmful species when they do release their ballast water. D2 is a performance standard which specifies the maximum amount of viable organisms allowed to be discharged, including specified indicator microbes harmful to human health. From day one, all ships must conform to at least the D1 standard and all new ships to the D2 standard. By 2024, all ships, new and existing, will have to conform to the D2 standard. For most existing ships, this involves installing special equipment, so there's an implementation timetable for them based on the date of their IOPPC renewal survey. But implementation of the convention actually begins straight away. For example, all ships, new and existing, must have a ship-specific ballast water management plan and an international ballast water management certificate issued by or on behalf of their flag state to confirm their compliance. Not only that, all ships will also have to carry a ballast water record book to provide evidence that ballast water procedures have been carried out correctly and all ships will be subject to inspections by port state control to confirm compliance, which may include actually sampling a ship's ballast water as well as inspecting the documentation. So what does this mean for the environment? Well, it's good news, and again, from day one. The requirement to exchange or treat ballast water applies to all ships immediately and without delay which means something that's been identified as a major environmental threat is being actively addressed. And IMO has delivered another significant milestone for the health of our planet. I just want to make sure that uh, I don't make too many assumptions that you might not, some people might not know what ballast water is and why it's important. And if you think way back to there are the early days of man in the 1400s with Columbus and earlier with the Vikings. These ships are, are pretty buoyant and they're not stable. You know, they, they when it come along a lot of waves, they're gonna blow them over. So they load up the hull 
with weight. And one way to do that is just fill it with water. And that's what ballast water is. They're using it for ballast to keep the ship stable. Anyway, that's the bulk of the presentation. We have some, uh, there's one more sort of slides coming up after this, but first I wanna make sure there's a couple YouTube clips where you could uh, learn a little bit more about Silent Spring and then a couple on point source and non-point source. Uh, the YouTube clip on jurisdictional waters as navigable waters, uh, if you like to get into politics or if you don't like it, watch this anyway, because uh, this video was taken just after the recent uh, navigable water protection rule came into effect here in the last few months. And I don't even know if it's been a few months, it might just be a month or two. So, uh, uh, and, it, and it's eliminated some waterways that won't be protected by the Clean Water Act anymore. So what drives these regulations? I mentioned earlier that there's this point source pollution and a non-point source pollution. So if EPA has the power and was delegated the authority to regulate point source, how do we regulate the non-point source? So there's two ways. One is good stewards of the land. Just like hopefully you and me will do things, whether it's pick up trash from our waterways or even on land, uh, do these beach cleanups. Uh, but if you look at some big waterways, what are the, the uh, pollutants that are, are common to most big waterways are sediment, nitrogen and phosphorus. And if the greatest source of those comes into non, through non-point sources, how do we regulate that? And the process of TMDLs, total maximum discharge limits of the process that has evolved, it's in the original Clean Water Act of 72, the amendments. So this is the process. And if you look at that video clip, you'll better understand that uh, the allocations that the point source, uh, they clean up, they're usually pretty good to get that, use up their allocation. And they want more. They would like to discharge more of their pollutant, perhaps, not always. Maybe they want to expand their operation. Well, if they go in and clean up some of the non-point source, then the regulators will allow them to discharge a little bit more of that particular pollutant. So, so that's, uh, 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 those are the, uh, say, part of the regulation that's really driving environmental cleanup nowadays. There's some uh, uh, videos on oil pollution and the aquatic nuisance species you could look up as well. So I am told that you people want to have or need to have some kind of little project. And I believe the next slide is gonna show a project that you could build pretty easily, uh, a monofilament fishing line recycling bin. And uh, the video is not the greatest quality, but what happens when you, people fill up this with uh, the monofilament line, groups will take that back, like Berkeley fishing line, they will recycle their lines. So let's watch this video. I'm Susan Shingledecker with the Boat U.S. Foundation for Boating Safety and Clean Water. Today we're going to show you how you can become involved in our monofilament fishing line recycling program. In just a few minutes, you can build a monofilament recycling bin of your own. Making your own monofilament recycling bin is fairly simple. You will need a two-foot section of PVC pipe, one PVC elbow, one PVC female threaded adapter, one PVC threaded plug, adhesive, decals and some signs. All of our pipe and fittings are six inch in diameter. You can order the pipe from a local plumbing supply store. Hardware stores usually only stock pipe up to four inches in diameter. In most cases, you will need to cut the pipe into two foot sections. To do this, we rented a 12 inch compound miter saw from a local hardware store. 
Other types of saws will work. It just depends on the volume of bins you are making. Starting with the two foot section of pipe, first attach the threaded adapter. Apply your adhesive. To apply the adhesive, first wet the PVC surface with a foam brush. Then apply a thin bead of adhesive around the adapter. Do not use too much adhesive as it does expand. Be careful not to get the adhesives on your hands or clothes. Fit the adapter on the pipe and tap on the ground to ensure a snug fit. There are a variety of adhesives you can choose from. Given our work with volunteers, we use a polyurethane adhesive that is less toxic and easier to handle than PVC cement. Next, attach the elbow. Ensure that any writing or marks on the pipe are positioned on the opposite side of the elbow opening so they will not be visible when the bin is mounted. Again, apply the adhesive and fit the elbow on the pipe. Tap the bin to ensure a snug fit. Next, thread the cap onto the adapter. Be sure that there isn't any glue residue on the threads before inserting the cap, or you will have trouble removing it later. We have drilled a drainage hole on the caps to allow water to easily drain from the bin. This can be done with a drill press or a simple drill. Finally, apply the decals to the bin. Decals are available on the Boat US Foundation website. Despite a large red no trash decal, trash often finds its way into the bins. To help minimize this, it is wise to locate your bins near a trash can. Your bin is now complete. There are a number of different ways to install your bin. See our website for suggestions. Once your bin is installed, be sure to check it regularly to empty it. As a safety precaution, wear gloves when emptying your bin. Never reach into the bin with your bare hands. A metal coat hanger or stick can help pull the line out if it gets stuck. A pair of nail clippers or small scissors are also good to have on hand. We have built an online tracking system that will allow you to enter and track the amount of line you collect. To enter your bin location, visit our website. I'm Susan Shingledecker with the Boat U.S. Foundation for Boating Safety and Clean Water. Today we're going to show you how you can become involved in our monofilament fishing line. There we go. So that's my presentation for this evening. And uh, we'll leave it up to you to ask some questions if you have some. Or even just some observations. David, thank you for your expertise and uh, tonight in sharing about the uh, Clean Water Act. We do have some initial questions that have come in. If anyone would like to ask questions themselves, please type them into the Q&A tool and we can go over those. Uh, so Dave, if the EPA can only regulate point source pollutants, how are non-point source pollu uh, sources of pollu pollution reduced? Yeah, I think I did touch on that near the tail end. Uh, that's where that process of the uh, total maximum daily load or too many darn lawyers, because there are a lot of them involved, uh, comes into play. So when a wastewater discharger, a, an industrial or municipal one with a point source discharge has a, uh, uh, a permit, it limits how much, what his load of a given pollutant could be. It might be nitrogen, it might be so, uh, it might be sulfur, it might be sediment, it might be copper, all kinds of uh, different criteria would be restricted. But if the water body, uh, the PMDL process itself, it's not only a, 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 a way to reduce pollution, but it's also a process to define the pollutants. So what will happen is the regulatory agencies typically go to these different water bodies in the state, they rotate around so that they try to get back to the same area at least once every five years. And they will assess the different water body segments to see if they're exceeding the, the water uh, criteria. And if they are, then they have to implement a TMDL and the process of TMDLs and total maximum daily loads. So the total maximum daily load for any given pollutant uh, is the amount that would theoretically make that receiving system clean and not polluted, or at least it would uh, no longer be in violation of the Clean Water Act parameters. And they divvy up the, all they allocate the loads amongst the point source and the non-point sources. And then they 
take aside maybe 10% of that and allocate it as a margin of safety. So here you've got the WLA, the waste load allocation that's given to industry and municipality to the point sources. And then you've got your uh, non-point source. It's given the LA, the load allocation of that formula. And typically, particularly with sediments, that's where the greatest source of pollutants are. And when it came, comes to things like nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, because it's running off our lands. We're adding too many fertilizers to our, our, uh, our plants and lawns, and it gets into the waterways. So if industry wants a greater allocation, they will go in and clean up some of the non-point source pollutant so that they can get a greater amount allocated to them. So at worst case, it remains the same, but typically they have to clean up a little bit more to get a little less of that allocation. Hope that makes some sense. It does, it does. And another question has come in. And first uh, it says, great session, thank you. And then the question is, what kind of projects do you think would be appropriate for Sea Scout ships? Uh, we are based in Annapolis, Maryland, and are looking for good environmentally related projects for our shipmates to pursue. Well, um, well, that's a lot of things that you could do there in the marine environment. There's a program going on in your area through uh, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and the local watermen. Now, the crab population, the blue crab population in Chesapeake Bay is kind of well, maybe even on the brink of, of collapsing. And so they restrict the crab catches and that takes away from the livelihood of these fishermen, these commercial fishermen. So they came up with a program a few years ago and the state will pay these fishermen that can't go crabbing to go out and find so-called ghost crabs, ghost uh, crab pots, ghost fishing. Look that term up, ghost fishing. What it is is when these commercial fishermen and even, even the recreational fishermen set out, for example, crab traps, or fish traps, they break away. You'd be surprised how many are in the greater Chesapeake Bay area, and a lot of them are mapped out. So they will pay these fishermen the, to go out and collect these. Uh, so if you people have a vessel in your local ship, I think you call it, then get out there and try to coordinate with VIMS and or the local fishermen and capture some of these, these uh, ghost fishing. Because once those things are out there, uh, they keep catching fish in them and they die and they rot and they become a source of pollution. They emit hydrogen sulfide. So and that's one that comes to mind. Of course, that monofilament fishing line is another one that you just saw for the Chesapeake Bay. Having a degree in marine science that I do, uh, uh, I, what the local people are doing is uh, cleaning up the beaches, cleaning up, uh, these watersheds that drain out there. So, Lord, I could go on and on, and you all should have my email. I think it'll get posted out there. Feel free to email me and uh, ask me questions like that, and I'll come up with a bunch of other projects for you. Very insightful, and as uh, Bruce just shared in the chat, that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is another good source of environmental projects. So for those in the Chesapeake Bay area, check that out uh, as well. And uh, so it's, you know, we have similar things across California as well. So there's, there are lots of ways to uh, participate. Now, uh, Dave, do sheens on water uh, always come from petroleum products? And if not, how can one distinguish uh, amongst them?
if it's a petroleum, you can tell if it's a petroleum based sheen uh, using some of your senses. For example, smell. You'll smell the petroleum usually. You can see a rainbow looking sheen on top. And uh, if you kind of put a stick in the water and swirl it around, that sheen will kind of separate and break apart and then come back together. So I'd say those are the three most common ways you can determine if that's uh, if that sheen is coming from oil. Uh, I will go one step further though and um, talk a little bit about the use of detergents. A lot of times you'll see um, an oil sheen in a marina and the marina operators don't want to be caught with oil sheens at their facilities. So they've often gone out and taken dish detergents like Dawn and put them in the water and then the sheen will coagulate and get heavy and sink. And now they think out of sight is out of mind. But the reality is it's smothering the macroinvertebrates and the benthic populations that live on the bottom. Now, that, that uh, Dawn, for example, is a great washing agent and is used to wash those birds and it's an acceptable product, the birds that the, are caught with the oil sheen in them because that messes up, they can't preen, that, that's devastating for, for wildlife. And uh, so Dawn is used to, to wash them. Now, to break up legally, the oil sheens, such as occurred with the uh, uh, big uh, um, horizon um, oil rig that uh, that disaster several years back, I'm sure many of you have heard of that one. Uh, they use dispersants, not washing agents, but dispersants. And that tends to break up the oil sheen into tiny little particles that will degrade much faster than big globules or big slicks of oil. Yes, uh, that is a good point. And we just had someone on the Facebook live stream comment that in their area, there is an annual coastal uh, cleanup and also several opportunities to rid the coast of invasive species. And I'm not sure what state uh, the commenter's from but California has that and it's also generally in September. And I know other states do similar uh, activities as well. So Dave, uh, if, if, you go on. To the, if, let me, if you go to the Ocean Conservancy website, you will find not only a lot of videos, little short video clips that are excellent uh, resources, but they will also get involved with this national ocean cleanup and beach cleanup and you report in and they, they tabulate how much uh, trash has been collected each year during the ocean. And they'll show you in their, on their site where there'll be in your state some areas to uh, register for that cleanup. Excellent. And the commenter on Facebook is from Mobile, Alabama. So it's great to see uh, that, that this happens as well. So, and uh, looking at other questions that we have, why are detergents like Dawn dish soap illegal to use on the oil sheens? Yes, it's because they, they take those sheens and they uh, cause them to um, uh, get together and get heavy for gobules and they'll sink. So that oil sheen, which was sitting on top of the water, and yes, there's some toxic gases in there, volatiles like naphthalene, but those gases will dissipate fairly quickly. So the biggest problem we've got with oil in terms of a pollutant is its physical effect. So if those sheens are left on the surface and would break up into small enough particles, they will dissolve, they'll be degraded by bacteria, but if you put the oil, the detergents on them, they're just going to sink to the bottom in big clumps, and they're not going to break down that fast. It'll take a whole lot longer, 
and it will smother all those organisms like coral reefs and, and little uh, aquatic the crabs that live on the bottom. All kinds of organisms live in that benthos environment. Excellent, very informative. And our uh, friend from uh, uh, Alabama says they have an influx of apple snails. And I haven't heard of those before, but that does not sound like fun. Uh, which brings us to uh, the last question that's come in so far. If anyone wants to ask more, please type away. Uh, and that is, do invasive species always do harm? And you alluded to this in your presentation uh, on the Great Lakes, uh, but uh, you don't care to elaborate on that. Well, uh, um, one story I like to tell, and it hasn't, it's not to do with, with the, uh, the aquatic species as much as it is uh, thermal pollution, or should it be called thermal enrichment? So when I was growing up on the South Shore of Long Island, come winter time, it'd get cold enough, but we'd want to go fishing. Where would we go? We would go to the discharges that the power companies were discharging because they were they used that water to cool uh, their their operations, cooling water, and they would discharge the warm water. Well, that warm water in the winter time attracted a lot of fish, and those were the spots to go fishing during the winter. During the summer. Not so much because it would that hot water would tend to cause the algal blooms. It would suck the oxygen out of the water. It would uh, things would decay. So, um, yeah, does that sort of answer the question? And the same thing with these invasive species. Kind of depends on on you know, like look out there in the environment. In, in my part of the country, Southwest Virginia, and I'm guessing Alabama too with kudzu. Kudzu was brought into this country, I don't know, back in the 30s maybe even, as a ground cover. And it's a great ground cover. It stops erosion, but the stuff just, you can sit there and watch it grow during the summer months. It's intolerant to cold weather. So if you live up north, you probably never saw kudzu, unless you've traveled down south. But kudzu uh, grows all over the trees and chokes them out, power mines and bushes. Right now, when I drive over to our local lake, I look over and I say, boy, we've got a good bumper crop of kudzu this year. So yeah, it's a good ground cover. We brought it in from Japan. It keeps soil erosion back but it chokes out all the other plants. Yeah, the speaking of invasive plants, there's a wonderful Stuff You Missed in History class podcast talking about an invasive plant down in Louisiana and this attempt that was in, I think the 1930s to bring in hippos to eat the invasive plant by bringing in an invasive species. Didn't wow. work. Uh, uh, they wanted to use hippos to replace cows for burgers, uh, but it is a fascinating story about bringing another creature to deal with another invasive species. Well, they brought in Nutria to, to try to uh, put some other animals in check. I don't remember what it was, but they've taken over. Yep. So, uh, David, this has been amazing. Really appreciate your insight and expertise. You know, we do have environmental requirements, and, you know, we believe in a scout is clean and to leave no trace. So you've been uh, wonderful tonight. Uh, I'll turn the show over to Bruce Johnson to help close us out and talk about next time. Bruce. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, just want to let you know that um, to, uh, next month we the topic is paddlecraft construction. It will be on uh, Tuesday, August 25th at the same time, 2100 Eastern, 1800 Pacific. And we'll have an announcement about this on both the Sea Scouts BSA and the Ox Scout Facebook pages. And uh, we'll encourage people to pre-register if you want to uh, uh, connect with Zoom, or you can uh, use the uh, Facebook uh, feed 
uh, to connect as well. So thank you very much, Dave. You did a great job this evening uh, and really appreciate uh, the insight that you've been able to share with uh, the scouts. And uh, I'll look forward to uh, working with you again in the future. All right, well, thank you. Appreciate y'all putting up with me. You have a good night. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank you.